Hello, everyone. This is Nina Olson, the Executive Director for the Center for Taxpayer Rights. And we are here today to have a tax chat as part of our series, Transforming Tax Administration, um, to, to address and talk about the issues facing um, international and immigrant taxpayers. And this will include a discussion of individual taxpayer identification numbers as well. We have an incredible lineup of guests today. And I, before I introduce them, I want to remind everyone that you can go into the chat. And if you have any comments or questions, um, the guests are all going to be watching the chat and we'll try to address them as we go along. We have a lot of topics to cover today. So I don't know that we'll be able to have it open for um, our attendees to speak, but please utilize the chat because we will be watching it. So I, the panel, and we're going to start with Mary Louise Serrato, who is the executive director of the organization American Citizens Abroad. We are then going to move to Mandy Matlock, who is doing an encore appearance in our Transforming Tax Administration series. And Mandy is from the um, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid Society, and she's an attorney on the staff there. Uh, Mandy was, for a while, the local taxpayer advocate in the Austin campus um, office of the Taxpayer Advocate Service. And as many of you know, the ITIN program, the processing of, you know, organization is at the Austin campus. And so Mandy is going to talk about ITIN processing issues and it, things that come up with that. Our next speaker will be Jackie Vimo, and Jackie is the Senior Economic Justice Policy Analyst with the National Immigration Law Center, and she's going to provide us some data and also an update on some legislation that her organization has been working on. And then we're going to close, but that's not really fair to say because his work is so important, with Pablo Blanc, who is... Um, the Director of Immigration Integration with CASA of Maryland, and he's going to really talk about the impact of all of these issues and policies that we're discussing on the immigrant population. So I just want to hand it over to Mary Louise, who can start and tell us about the issues that international taxpayers, who U.S. taxpayers who are abroad, are seeing. So thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you for inviting ACA here today to talk about the issues. ACA, um, just briefly, we are nonprofit, nonpartisan, um, a 501c4 headquartered in Washington, D.C. We've been um, working at, at representing U.S. citizens overseas for 45 years now. We have a sister organization, ACA Global Foundation, that is involved in research and education. It's the 501c3. I'll talk a little bit later on about um, some of the um, uh, work we've done on research. So there, for U.S. citizens living and working overseas, there are a, a mountain of issues. Um, a, a lot of this has to do with just the complexity of the tax code. Um, and as the tax code becomes more and more complex, it becomes exponentially more complex for Americans living and working over, overseas. And with that are obviously um, uh, filing uh, issues, huge filing issues for the community. Um, the U.S. is unique, uh, many of you probably know in that it taxes based on citizenship as opposed to taxing based on where income is earned, which is pretty much the standard for the rest of the world. Um, if you're earning income in France, it's taxed by the French authorities um, and, and quote unquote, shouldn't be taxed uh, in our mind by the US. Um, but the US says, no, we are gonna tax based on your US citizenship, no matter where you're living and working. So US citizens overseas have to first file um, a tax return in the jurisdiction in which they live. And then they have to file a tax return um, for the US. Finding resources when you're outside of the country and good, um, uh, good advice can be difficult and can be costly. That is one of the big, big issues for filing. A simple filing from, from outside the United States 
there is no simple filing from outside the United States. There are a lot of pieces of legislation that have been targeted towards um, combating tax evasion. They have high penalties. And if you make errors on those filings, you can find yourself with a, 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 a huge tax bill and penalties that just, just for making a simple filing error. So a lot of individuals will go and try to do, um, uh, to try to find a professional tax preparer. And like I said, um, there are not a whole lot of resources for this. It's hard to find and it can be very costly. So the, the current policy makes it very difficult for Americans overseas to invest, to save, um, because there are so many differences between the, the tax codes that in the jurisdiction they may be living in and the US tax code. So the US obviously has some mitigating tools so that there is no double taxation. There is the foreign earned income exclusion, which is an annual exclusion of earned income. I believe this year it's 112,000. And there's also foreign tax credits, but there are limitations to this. So the foreign earned income exclusion is earned income. So if you're living and working overseas and you're retired and uh, you're not quote unquote earning income, you can't use the foreign earned income exclusion. Foreign tax credits, um, if they mirror a US tax, it can be used, but if they don't, you can't apply them. So there are many jurisdictions that use VAT taxes, value added taxes to raise quote unquote income taxes. Some jurisdictions use wealth tax. These aren't recognized by the United States. So you, you don't have access to those foreign tax credits. Um, then there is the whole filing of financial accounts overseas. Um, many of you probably have heard um, of FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Um, that is a piece of legislation where Americans or anyone who's holding um, foreign accounts overseas needs to report that. That, that. that report is on your annual tax filing report. You also are required to file an FBAR or a foreign bank account report. And this is Timed, uh, it, the, the timing is is uh, been aligned with um, your um, your tax filing. However, it's not included in your uh, your your tax filing. It's done online, and there are different requirements, filing requirements for the two forms. They're looking for foreign bank accounts overseas, but there is a certain requirement for for, for the FBAR essentially every bank account. And that might be something that you don't think is a bank account, but the US um, government does or the IRS does. For example, it may be a foreign pension and the US um, doesn't recognize certain foreign pensions. So that would have to be on your FBAR. FATCA is a different reporting uh, requirement. It has a much higher threshold. Um, so certain things, go on one report, certain things go on another. This is very confusing. And the issue is um, really that these reports are all about combating tax evasion. They're all about combating money laundering. So the penalties can be quite onerous. And if you make a, a simple filing error, you might find yourself in front of 10,000 or $50,000 in penalties and have to work that out with the IRS. Nina can probably talk um, at great length about the problems with FBAR, people suddenly waking up and realizing that they had to file an FBAR and they came into a compliance system that was really created for bad actors, but they got caught up in it. Um, and I think many of those cases went to Nina and the taxpayer advocate. Uh, to be adjudicated. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's confusing, it's costly, and there's many people outside of the United States who are Americans who are what we hear often called accidentals. So these may, these, there, there's no real definition for these people, but the, the general idea is these are individuals who are born in the United States, return to their country of 
quote unquote origin, where their parents are from. Their parents may have been working in the US for a short time, may have been at school. And they leave when they're very young. Perhaps some of them know that they are American citizens. Some may not know they're American citizens. And suddenly they woke up when FATCA was introduced as legislation and there was a lot of um, information going out about um, having to file taxes if you were an American, having to file an FBAR. And suddenly their banks were coming to them and saying, in order for us to keep your bank account open, according to FATCA and the, the uh, legislation, because the bank as well as the American is reporting on the accounts, you're reporting through your tax filing, but the foreign financial institution is reporting to the IRS or um, to their government through intergovernmental agreements. And they wanted social security numbers. And many of these individuals didn't have social security numbers. Getting one from overseas is a difficult process, can be a difficult process, I shouldn't say is, but can be a difficult process because you have to show to social security documentation to indicate that you've lived overseas. And that documentation can vary depending on what country the individual is in. So many of these accidentals had a very difficult time getting social security numbers. Suddenly COVID arrived, US embassies, federal benefit unit uh, units were shut down. And those, those were the units that were that are really responsible for um, helping individuals apply for first time social security numbers. And so these individuals were faced with losing their foreign financial accounts. Um, that still can be the case, um, even if you do have a, a social security number. Many of the banks, just foreign financial institutions or foreign banks, simply don't want to have US clients because they are baked into the penalty uh, assessments if they're harboring an undeclared American. So in many cases, the easiest thing to do is just to remove these individuals from the client base. I will just dip my foot into the nightmare that it can be for individuals who have small businesses overseas or consultancies. Many of these individuals got caught up in the TCGA um, legislation, the Tax Cuts and Jobs um, uh, Act, where suddenly a small one-man consultancy is being treated like large multinationals who are offshoring profits. So think about the American who may own a yoga studio in France, has been putting 100 euros away every month because you know a year from now she wants to buy new yoga mats she's not offshoring um also the filing a lot of the forms for filing are quite complex um the form 5471 you have to understand the difference between perhaps passive income versus dividends that were resourced at treaty general versus foreign branch are you a foreign branch many sole proprietors overseas, consultancies. They're not thinking that they're, uh, they're a foreign branch. And the Form 5471, it's not part of a lot of the DIY software. And on top of that, the IRS has estimated that this form itself takes about 38 hours to complete. So you can see from, from all of this, there's just a high level of complexity in, from, from filing there's a fear of, of penalties for not filing correctly. There's also problems that we think the IRS should dedicate some of this new funding to, to, to help correct some of these issues. Nina spoke a little bit early on, maybe before all of you were on, about getting notices from the IRS and delays in, in the receipt of those notices. A lot of times people overseas will receive a notification that they have to respond back to the IRS within 30 days. They receive it beyond that 30 day window. That can be really frightening um, because the, the, you're, you're not dealing online or electronically with the IRS. You're doing a lot of this with, with um, hard copy. And there's a passport revocation provision, which a lot of people might not be aware of, but if you have an outstanding tax bill, you could 
find yourself in a situation where your passport could be revoked or denied. So we really think that there's an opportunity to do a better job on getting notices and, to, and, and information out to Americans living overseas. Right now, Americans living overseas don't have the ability to create online accounts. Um, we really, really, really need to have a portal where US citizens overseas with foreign addresses and foreign phone numbers can be able to create accounts, be able to have a, a dialogue with the IRS. This is the easiest way for these people to deal with um, notifications, updating themselves, finding out the latest, greatest, um, you know, of, of what's going on with their tax return, because you're dealing with so many individuals in so many different time zones with a lot of different delivery problems, whether that be hard copy mail, or just trying to get a phone call. Phone calls um, into the IRS from overseas, no toll-free number for Americans who are living overseas. Right now you have to call um, the, I believe it's Puerto Rico. Um, the wait times are, I, I cannot tell you how many times we have had people come to us and say, I sat on the phone for two hours waiting to get an agent. And then once they, the agent gets on the call, many times the, they, they are unable to answer the questions. Um, a lot of this, as you can see from what I was discussing, can be quite technical, can be uh, uh, not straightforward. And a lot of the IRS agents just don't have the, 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 the responses for these individuals. There are no longer any IRS offices located outside of the United States and embassies and consulates like there used to be in the years past. I believe the last four closed, Nina probably knows this better than me, in 2014 and 2015. So you don't even have... Um, the ability, let's say you live in Europe, you used to be able to at least in real time get in contact with the Paris um, IRS um, attache, and that's no longer the case. You don't have the ability to do a lot of this online, online with the IRS. You don't have a toll-free number. All of this funding should really go into getting systems in place so that there's more customer service. Um, I'll just say last couple of things because I'm probably eating up most of my time. Uh, no on-site clinics um, like you have in the U.S. to go to your, you know, public library, find out, you know, how, how do I file? What's the difference between these two reports? Um, and the IRS website. Now, I have to say they, they have um, made some improvements. Um, ACA was able to work with the team on the Taxpayer First Act. We highlighted a lot of these problems. They have made some improvements, but still it's not straightforward. Um, a lot of times you'll go there, the, the questions, yes, they're for individuals. You click on a, a video to find out, you know, I'm a small business, how do I file this? Suddenly you're thrown into international corporate taxation. Um, so we'd love to see, those are the problems we'd love to see the, some of the new IRS funding go into those areas. Obviously for us, the solution is let's go to residence-based taxation. Let's tax people the way the rest of the industrialized world does it. Um, but that's a discussion for another day, I think. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, listening to you, I just get more and more depressed, um, you know, having dealt with these issues and, you know, I, the, it's hard to explain the impact on people overseas as the IRS ramps up to look at offshore income and yet ignores the fact that there are millions of people overseas who are doing legitimate work and have legitimate reasons for their financial accounts over there and are just trying to live their lives. And the complete absence of any kind of taxpayer service for them. I mean, going back to 2002, we were advocating for a toll-free line. And at one point I was visiting the UK att tax attache when they had them. And I asked them, well, how, you know, how does the embassy communicate 
with people and they had, you know, a voice over the internet protocol. And I went back to the IRS and said, look, if the, you know, if the State Department can do this, why can't you do it? Well, that just never went anywhere. Um, I, so, you know, I think, Mary Louise, you've really made a case for this population, which is not the, the multinationals, but are just people trying to live their lives. Um, and then a whole bunch of accidental citizens who are sucked into our system. As I segue over to Mandy, um, we talked about this, and I want to give some background. We've been um, in some of the tax chats really trying to provide some context for some of the issues that exist today. And so I thought I would spend just a little bit of time on ITIN issues, um, you know, given that, you know, I entered the IRS in 2001 as the National Taxpayer Advocate. Prior to that, in 1995 and 96, the Treasury Department had issued a regulation that created the individual taxpayer identification number. For people who had tax filing obligations, but could not um, obtain a social security number. And in the past, what they would do when they were filing a return, this was really predating electronic filing in a way, they would write Social Security Admin Act Section 205 something, I forget the actual section, but it was basically you're supposed to write that in above the space where you're supposed to put your social security number. And internally, what the IRS would do was assign an alphanumeric number that would allow their systems to process your return because they couldn't process your return if you didn't have a number. You didn't know that number, but they had a number. And in 95, I think it was, they issued a regulation that talked about this individual taxpayer identification number. And immediately, those of us, I was running a clinic at the time, and this was before low-income taxpayer clinic funding in the Internal Revenue Code. It was 1996. You know, we saw that and went, aha, this really works for all of these taxpayers that we have, including, you know, mixed families with some undocumented members in it, et cetera. And we can surface them and get them to file returns, and that helps with their immigration status. And in 1996, the Community Tax Law Project held the first ever um, continuing legal education program on immigration issues and tax issues and got people to really look at them combined. Um, and ITIN was front and center, and we were very excited. Well, fast forward to my becoming the National Taxpayer Advocate, and you have September 11th, 2001. And from that point on, um, the whole government, you know, you had the Patriot Act, you had so much attention on identity and people coming into this country. And people glommed on to the idea that the ITIN was using, um, was a way for people to get some kind of documentation. At that time, it was a card. So it looked like something that you could use to get a driver's license and open bank accounts and things like that. And um, in August of 2002, the commissioner issued a memorandum kind of in response to a Treasury Inspector General audit looking at, um, at the ITIN usage and listed a whole bunch of stuff, including mentioning that the IRS had gone out and reached out to every single Department of Motor Vehicles in the country, telling them that they shouldn't be accepting ITINs in order to issue driver's licenses. And you fast forward even further that... Um, toward the end of 2002 and then the beginning January 13th, 2003, there was a meeting of the senior leadership of the IRS, which I attended, um, in which the IRS discussed 22 um, recommendations. And chief among those recommendations was that the IRS and any volunteer organizations such as VITAs or LIT, low-income taxpayer clinics, the IRS at that point was, was preparing returns itself in its walk-in sites. That chief among them was that the, that the IRS would not allow its employees or its volunteers to prepare any returns in which there was an ITIN with a social security number or, so, or W-2 associated with it, where there was an SSN slash ITIN mismatch on the withholding document and the tax return. They also wanted to recommended that they would treat ITIN and social security mismatches as unprocessable returns so that they would reject them in e-filing and on paper until you had submitted documentation proving your identity. 
Um, and then there were a whole bunch of other recommendations in that list of 22, and I went apoplectic. Um, and as a result of that, we created a task force, and um, they did have a taxpayer advocate representative on that task force. We got some of the most heinous recommendations eliminated, but you saw the um, focus on iTunes. The inspector general kept coming out with reports about that. Um, I'll, I'm going to try to make this really quick and only talk for five more minutes, but I think this is important background. Um, in 2003, the inspector general came out and did a research study showing that only about 30% of all items that had been issued showed up on tax returns. And that was by way of trying to get the IRS to not really stop issuing items to people who needed them. Um, I had just hired one person in my research staff, and we I just kept saying, that's got to be wrong. Well, my research advisor looked at the TIGDA data and found that TIGDA had only looked at primary, the primary taxpayer on the return. They had not looked at the secondary spouse, and they had not looked at the dependents. And when you took all of that data into account, it turned out that about 75% of the items that had been issued historically since the very beginning showed up on returns, which made sense that some of them would be only there for one year because you're in the country and you need to file a return, you know, so there's always going to be some turnover of items. That sort of started putting some breaks on some of the proposals that we saw because we were really able to undercut some of the assumptions with data. And then things started happening. Um, in 2004, there was a case in Kentucky with the Kentucky walk-in site where IRS employees in Kentucky uh, in the walk-in center started working with one agent in the inspector general's office who, when they saw taxpayers coming in with appointments and needing to get returns prepared with items on the returns, they took their item cards and often took their passports and referred them to um, inspector general and the inspector general referred them then to um, immigration. And these taxpayers were deported just because they were trying to file there and comply with their filing obligations. Later on, we got a case in Greeley where the of Colorado, where the sheriff of Greeley basically did, did a search of a return preparer who had was preparing for the ITIN population and got all the taxpayers' files. There was there were court cases involved, the ACLU involved, and that was declared an unlawful search. So we have the, you know, you see this sense coming through. In 2008, I wrote a most serious problem, making recommendations for how to deal with this. And in 2009, I issued a taxpayer advocate directive all the way up to the deputy commissioner um, of the IRS recommending improvements, most of which were not accepted. Um, and with that, I mean, we've gone on and on and on about iTunes. It's just an endless issue. But I did want to give you some of the background of where some of this, you know, whereas in 1996, it was viewed as this is really going to solve problems. After September 11th and the focus on, you know, terrorism, you see this incredible narrowing and paranoia and really an anti, um, you know, ITIN taxpayer perspective. So, Mandy, I will turn it over to you with that introduction. Thanks, Nina. And um, sorry to pile on, but I'll tell you that when I was the local taxpayer advocate in Austin, we did have a case where a local tax uh, tax office seized a passport from a taxpayer who was coming in to have his documents certified. The um, the personnel in that office contacted Criminal Investigation Division, and uh, because the passport did not have a date of entry stamp on it, and they concluded that he was illegally in the United States and seized his passport. Um, so those uh, types of things have not been completely abated, despite all of our advocacy efforts over the years. Um, so I am going to share a little bit, just give a kind of broad overview about the processes that the I-10 unit follows when they're processing Forms W-7 applications for I-10s. And uh, I guess discuss a few things that have come up uh, under on my watch when I was the uh, local taxpayer advocate in Austin. So you know that those um, Applications are centralized in the often uh, in the Austin campus, and they're processed by the I-10 operation there on campus. 
Well, the uh, local taxpayer advocacy office in Austin has uh, centralized jurisdiction over all problems with that process. So uh, if there's anyone applying for task assistance with an I-10 issue, that goes to the Austin office. So we had a lot of inventory to from which we could glean uh, trends and, and, and find issues and things that were happening. Um, I think, um, and this is not a problem unique to the Taxpayer Advocate Service, it's the IRS as a whole, there is a, uh, a problem with a large turnover and an attrition, ability to uh, have permanent leadership. And I know when I joined Austin TAS, they had not had a permanent taxpayer advocate for a number of years. And when I left TAS, they didn't have a permanent uh, LTA for a couple of years. So um, when you don't have someone at the helm who can can pick out these issues and see these trends when they arise, it, it makes it difficult for them to, to basically bubble to the surface and get, get the attention that they deserve. Um, and uh, so starting with the beginning of the process, the uh, taxpayer who or the person who needs to apply for an I-10 is uh, submitting a W-7. And um, from, the, from the very start, the problem you have there is that these must be submitted on paper by mail, and um, they must include original documents or some combination, some magic combination of approved other documents. Um, there, there are some processes in place to avoid sending your original documents to the IRS, and I think uh, later speakers will talk about those. Um, but there have been a, a lot of problems with the certifying acceptance agent program that was uh, intended to, to make it easier for taxpayers to um, avoid sending their original documents to the IRS, which nobody, I don't want to send my original documents anywhere, but much less to the IRS. Um, the... <clears throat> I, I can tell you that uh, most uh, folks who are applying do send in original documents. These include passports. Um, the passport can be really the only identification document that many undocumented people have in their possession when they're in the United States. And so sending it to the Internal Revenue Service and waiting for it to be returned if it does get returned is a very scary proposition. Um, but there's, um, and as, as Nina pointed out, and as I just mentioned an example that we had, um, you can take these documents into the Taxpayer Assistance Center and have them certified on the spot and be able to walk away with your documents. But obviously there are some risks with this. Um, additionally, I would point out that the Taxpayer Assistance Centers are not able uh, they're not authorized to, to certify all of the documents. Um, I think they can, can certify 11 of 13 potential documents that are approved to support a, a Form W-7. Um, so TICTA, uh, Nina mentioned the TICTA uh, report, uh, that, that same 20, uh, that same report, or actually one later, TICTA raises this perennially, okay? They do not approve of the document tracking processes employed by the unit that um, receives these documents. And I can tell you that our inventory and tasks reflected a lot of problems with their procedures. Um, they uh, receive these packages of W-7s with original documents, and they are used and manipulated and sorted and chained and um, moved around and processed by clerks and others in the I-10 unit. Uh, but the, the, the contents of each package are not inventoried when they're received. And so they may be uh, placed on carts, batched with other things, moved around. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for documents to be separated from the application that they've arrived with. And um, no one inventories the contents of a package until many months after it arrives and has been opened and used in the, in this, in, um, in the I-10 unit. And so one of the, the the largest sources of our cases at the local uh, Taxpayer Advocate Service office there was helping people whose documents had disappeared. 
Um, so that's one of the problems with how they process these. And, and that's um, should be relatively simple to resolve. I think the larger problems come in with the um, the hostility towards this program that has pervaded, I mean, it, it came from outside, from Congress, from uh, other stakeholders concerned with misplaced concerns about what was happening with the misuse of items. And um, my feeling is that it permeated the, the, the top echelons of the folks who are operating this program. And um, it, uh, it seems that uh, as time has gone on and as Congress has added more um, restrictions to the program, that uh, fewer and fewer applicants are being approved and that there is an, an increasingly hostile attitude inside the IRS towards issuing ITINs. Um, so back in the process of dealing with the application, when finally the tax examiner in the I-10 operations is assigned to look at the, the, the package, and that can be, like I said, many months after it arrived in, in their area and many months after it was opened initially, um, only then are the contents of the package logged and the taxpayer's identification documents worked over. Um, just briefly, um, what happens at that point, once the uh, tax examiner inputs all of the items that are needed into what's called the RTS program, which is their dinosaur of a program that they use to manage this process, again, not unique to them. The IRS has a million dinosaur programs that they use to uh, do their work. So the RTS program is one of these. The um, tax examiner inputs all of the contents of the W-7 and uh, inventories the contents of the packages and evaluates the documents provided and um, puts all of that into the RTS and RTS will spit out a determination. And um, it could be a hard reject, it could be a soft reject. Um, most often it's a suspense letter, which is a 45 day letter that goes out the door. It's uh, systemically created. It goes out to the taxpayer and says, uh, and provides information about what they need to do to complete the, the application. And if there's no response within the 45 days, then there's a systemic rejection. And um, after a systemic rejection, the taxpayer may send in late documents in response to the suspense letter and uh, the, the package can be reworked. And I, I can't really say because I don't remember, um, how long the taxpayer has after the 45 days that they can get their rejection reversed by corresponding with the department. But I think it's important to point out that there's no ability for the taxpayer. There is a number on the suspense letter, okay? But you can't call that number and find out information relevant to your case. You can't talk to someone who knows what's going on and who can uh, tell you anything more than what's written on that um, on that suspense letter. Um, there's no uh, one person assigned who who can respond to concerns of the taxpayer, and this is a huge shortcoming in the process. Um, one thing that I noticed when we were at Austin TAS is that uh, the, the I-10 unit, and I, I took a look at the IRS website yesterday, they say what their um, processing time is, and they say it's 11 weeks. Well, I can tell you that they said it was 11 weeks when I was working in the Austin TAS office, and it was not 11 weeks. And one of the um, recommendations that we made repeatedly to the I-10 unit is that they be honest about their processing times in public facing information, which we thought might cut down on our caseload because um, we frequently had applicants to test beyond the 11 week, uh, the alleged processing time of 11 weeks, who um, when we found out the truth about what was happening in the I-10 unit, um, th there was nothing we could do for them because the processing timeframes were significantly longer than what was publicly disclosed. 
Um, in fact, one of the things that we did when I was at Austin TAS was we established a sort of back channel with their, well, I don't want to say back channel because it was approved, with their p &A analyst, and we got a report every Monday in our office telling us what their real time frames were. And we were able to use these real time frames to manage expectations for customers that we were trying to assist. Um, because people's packages were sitting on carts and they were lining hallways and uh, they were significantly delayed in their processing time. But, um, but for all the public knew, they needed, they were, they needed only 11 weeks to complete the, complete the entire process. I um, mean, I noticed that the last two NTA objectives to Congress reports actually had items related to the I-10's processing delays. And so I'm assuming that the 11 weeks that I saw uh, on, on IRS website yesterday is still a fantasy like it was when I was at Austin TAS. Um, I, one other thing I noticed in the NTA objectives report to Congress that came out recently for fiscal year 2023, and this is this is alarming, and I and I'm hoping that uh, those of you who practice in this area will take note and kind of um, get curious about this. But it said that uh, the rates of rejected renewal applications in tax years for tax years 20 and 21 were respectively 20.5 percent and 17.9 but that the rejection rate in the first quarter of 2022 skyrocketed to 37.6%. And um, it just makes me wonder, uh, you know, what is happening there? And um, because this unit is kind of a black box. I mean, the, what happens when you get that hard reject or even that soft reject, if you don't come forward with whatever they're asking for in that letter is it's over for you. There's no appeal. I mean, that's that's the that's the hard truth. Um, you, there's no independent office of appeals looking at what has happened with this case and whether there were mistakes that should be corrected. Um, so, as we talked about the the I ten program has been uh, restricted over time. In the PATH Act in 2015, uh, and this is something that those of us who've been practicing in low-income tax for over 20 years um, will remember how painful this was when it came out. Um, the PATH Act in 2015 removed retroactive EITC claims. And so they took that off the table, but it also impl implemented mandatory deactivations for a certain number of ITINs, uh, for, for certain ITINs. Mandatory expirations and renewals for ITINs, whereas there had never been that. Um, and in just under five years, IRS, after, after passage of the PATH Act, the IRS deactivated something like 18 million ITINs. Um, the other thing that happened in the PATH Act is that they said uh, TICTA has to do a report every two years. Well, TICTA has been hammering I-10 operations, um, and, and they have a lot to say about how the program is being conducted. And honestly, I feel like uh, this program, I mean, it's true, this program is just under fire. It's been under fire, and a lot of the, the things that they've been doing on the inside are in response to that. Um, in 2017, we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act which made further changes to the program um, inadvertently. So what happened was it reduced the exemption amount for spouses and dependents to zero for tax years 2018 to tax year uh, 2025. In its effort to implement the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and ensure that ITINs were only assigned to persons with a federal tax purpose, the I-10 unit established procedures that were intended to ensure that a spouse and a dependent uh, filing an I-10 application would only be approved if the spouse or dependent qualified the taxpayer for some other tax benefit besides the dependency exemption, since that, that benefit was worth zero dollars now. Um, thus was born the allowable tax benefit. Uh, this is um, a convention of the Internal Revenue Manual. This is a uh, policy analysis of um, the PNA folks over at um, the I-10 operations uh, created this allowable tax benefit. And they listed them to include um, a spouse filing a joint return, 
the head of household filing status, American Opportunity Tax Credit, premium tax credit, credit for other dependents, and credit for dependent and care credit. So the idea was that if a taxpayer wanted to list a spouse or a dependent on their tax return, um, dependency exemption wasn't good enough. They had to, though that uh, listed dependent would have to qualify them for one of these other quote unquote allowable tax benefits. Um, and I raise this because I just want to point out an example of what happened um, thereafter. So what happened was disastrous for some taxpayers. These procedures that the I-10 operation codified into the Internal Revenue Manual and followed until early 2022, systematically and wrongfully denied ITINs to the dependents and spouses of US taxpayers who resided in Mexico and Canada. And I, um, I, was, I was the local taxpayer advocate at the time. I wasn't, I had, not, I had never practiced in this area. I worked for legal services. I worked previously for a legal services uh, corporation uh, funded entity that prohibits us from representing folks who, um, who are undocumented. And so I, I had no experience filing W-7s. Um, but the rules for dependency exemptions didn't get changed by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and a dependent exemption needs to be a U.S. citizen or national unless they're a resident of a contiguous country. And what the ITIN did, uh, the ITIN unit did, was establish procedures that disregarded this exception. So they directed their examiners, their tax examiners, to reject the W-7s of any dependents and spouses who did not prove that they were U.S. residents. And this went on for, I really can't say how long it went on for, but um, I was... Um, lucky enough to have a case advocate in my office who had two of these cases come in at the same time, one where a Canadian dependent was denied an I-10 and one where uh, a Mexican dependent was denied an I-10. And she brought it to me and we, we looked at it and we said, well, this isn't the law. Um, this is wrong. And what it amounted to, in my view, is a sort of mini pre-audit. So the I-10 unit was determining that this person was not entitled to the head of household filing status because they didn't have a qualifying child for, for those purposes. And um, since this person wasn't a qualifying child in their thinking, they rejected the I-10 application. And those folks did not, did not get an I-10. Um, we solved that problem, thankfully, with a number of uh, taxpayer assistance orders to the I-10 unit, to the director of the I-10 unit, and then working with the attorney advisors and TAS to do an emergency um, repeal of all of their ERM provisions that stated that this is how they had to manage the process. But I point this out because, you know, how many taxpayers were harmed by this? We don't know. The IRS declined to do a comprehensive review of, of those cases. And um, if there had been an appeals process, would this have come to light? I don't know. I mean, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, so that's a little bit of the overview and a little bit of insight that I've gleaned from my time at TAS. And um, I will uh, go ahead and let the other folks move on with the presentation. Mandy, thank you for that. It, I, I'm just continuing to get even more depressed. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think I do want to say this, the, the issue of, of um, not being, we had some discussion about, about you know, can TAS help, dis, dis, you know, disregarding documents, things like that. I really think that that you gave an example of a taxpayer assistance order, and I really think that that's where TAS should be playing a role. That you're coming in and you are saying to the IRS, "This is wrong. It's just procedural. It's not the law, and therefore we are going to flood you with taxpayer assistance orders, and you are going to have to deal with them." Um, and that is one way to get things changed. And you have and. The other thing is that you've got the stories to tell about this, which really shows what's happening to people. Um, and I think we should be insisting on TAS for doing that. And um, this issue of timing, I do want to come in about timing. This is not really a practice video, but I do want to, to talk about this. The statute governing the Taxpayer Advocate Service says that 
one of the things that you where when you can issue a taxpayer assistance order is when the IRS is delayed more than 30 days over normal processing time. That's not what the statute says. It just says when you're 30 days old. That's what it says. It just says if something with an account is over 30 days. Well, that's everything in the IRS. So TAS has put out guidance saying over normal processing time. Well, I'm sorry. The Taxpayer Advocate Service is the voice of the taxpayer inside the IRS. And therefore, I don't care what the IRS says is its normal processing time. It's only what it tells taxpayers is its normal processing time. So if the IRS is hiding behind an 11 week normal processing and that's on the website, then TAS should be taking the position that anything over 11 weeks qualifies for the issuance, not only of getting the case into TAS, but issuing a taxpayer assistance order under 7811 of the Internal Revenue Code. I'm not the national taxpayer advocate anymore, but any of you out there should be making those arguments. And you can, when we post this video, you can get the transcript and put it up there. But that's my interpretation of the law. And that's my interpretation of what should be TASS's position on this issue. So having- I agree my, with you. you. And um, my uh, arguments fell on deaf ears. And certainly we were in an extraordinary time because it was during the pandemic. And um, I think that there were a lot of agreements with business operating divisions to let them catch up. But anyway, that, and I wasn't in charge you know, The IRS has had time to catch up. And it's also just <laughs> yes. $8 billion. Maybe it's reduced to $60 billion, but some of that money, and that's the point of this transforming tax administration, can go to expressly dealing with these issues. And um, TAS needs to hold them accountable. Um, and at least if the IRS wants to say it's going to take, you know, 360 days to process an ITIN application and hide behind that internally and tie the hands of TAS, then it should be putting that publicly on the website so we can all see it. And then we can go to Congress and say, really, you know, really? Okay. So Jackie, I'm going to turn it over to you to sort of flesh out the impact and maybe possibly some solutions. Um, Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I, some of the things that I've said are, are I'm going to just go over our sort of big picture um, that have already been covered. But let's um, have a short little. Uh, one of the things that sort of I, I uh, am interested in in talking with folks about sort of is is a is a puzzle um, that uh, is related to the policy issues, and I'm going to talk about some of the uh, policy solutions. Um, so in 2015, um, ITIN. Uh, according to the Taxpayer Advocate Report to Congress, uh, ITIN taxpayers paid 13.5 billion in net taxes, and um, 14, 4 point, there were 4.4 4 million ITIN returns. Um, I think that you know it's also important to remember that ITIN filers make state and local uh, tax contributions, and also pay disproportionately um, relative to higher income. Um, uh, there's a recent report about DACA recipients that they alone pay two billion dollars in state and local taxes. And that's a larger share of their incomes than uh, than the top one percent of taxpayers do. Um, you know, at the same time, ITIN taxpayers are ineligible for most benefits, and so we have you know a, a, a system of inequity here. Um, I think the other thing that makes it important to remember is that about one in five children experiencing poverty in the U.S. has an ITIN holder parent, um, and thus has little access to tax credits. So um, this is an issue of, of poverty, but also about 3.5 million either U.S. citizen children or uh, 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 green card holder children actually have uh, at least one ITIN parent. Um, so one of the, the the puzzle that I'm sort of interested in chatting with folks about and, and that I think that we should dig into more is, is in 2015, as I mentioned, there were $13.5 billion in net taxes paid by ITIN filers and 4.4 million returns. By 2019, that number had plummeted to 5.8 in, in net taxes from primary and secondary filers and 2 million ITIN returns. So what happened? You know, what's going on that we slash the numbers? Um, the uh, we also the, the 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 numbers of ITIN filers peaked in 2015, and um, you know uh, have been steadily going down. Um, and so one of the things that I want to just map out is sort of what are the key policies that can help explain this, and what can we do to to address this fact that there are ITIN filers out there that want to be paying taxes, and yet there are barriers out there that are keeping them from paying taxes and receiving tax credits. So of course, the first is the EITC, um, which uh, the, was the the Social Security number requirement was instituted in um, in 1996, and then in 2021. 
um, uh, there is actually, uh, I, t I think something that is often not known is that uh, U.S. workers who have children uh, without social security numbers can now qualify for the childless worker credit. Um, and and that there's not enough education about that because there's many mixed status families that are not eligible for the EITC but could qualify for the childless worker credit. Um, the PATH Act, as uh, as uh, was mentioned, or as Mandy mentioned earlier, um, is is really the big explanatory variable about why we saw the big dip in in taxes. We have the three-year expiration uh, date for unused ITINs and a staggered renewal for all ITINs, um, and expired ITINs must be renewed to file taxes. We have uh, prevention of re retroactive claims for the EITC, prevention of retroactive claims for the child tax credit, and prevention of retroactive claims for the AOTC. So, you know, the, there are a lot of people, as we're, we're going to talk about more, you know, who during the pandemic were unable to uh, file their taxes because of the barriers in the pandemic. And yet, because of the PATH Act, they're unable to um, claim those, those uh, tax credits retroactively. So the big one, of course, is the TCJA in 2017 um, that imposed the new social security number requirement, stripping the CTC from approximately 1 million children. At the same time, it did also add the $500 non-refundable credit for ineligible children that were, uh, that were ineligible for the, um, the CTC. Uh, uh, the other sort of important policy issue that's going on is the certified acceptance agent moratorium, which hasn't been mentioned too much yet, which is that beginning in August of 2022, the IRS imposed a moratorium on, this, on the acceptance agent program. And the last we've heard, if anyone has more updates, it's still going on through the end of the summer and will not be ended in August uh, as we had sort of initially hoped. Um, this is a huge issue because as, as Mandy was discussing, people need to be able to go to CAAs to, to be able to have their documents verified in person so that they don't have to put them into the black hole of the US Postal Service and the IRS and be without their documents for, for long periods of time. Uh, you know, there also was a major backlog during the um, during the pandemic, and this nine to eleven weeks uh, time frame was even worse during the peak of the pandemic. Around 2020, 2021, we had people waiting up to a year to have their ITIN applications processed. Um, I, I had several, you know, folks that had clients that had uh, were waiting for up to a year, um, and and that those backlogs have decreased. But you know, I think that we still have to. The, the nine to 11 week threshold is still uh, you know, too high and also uh, not fully accurate as Mandy mentioned. Um, I think the other issue that we wanna mention is that there have been uh, racial disparities in tax credits, um, in, access, in accessing tax credits. Uh, we know that uh, between 2019 and 2020, 78% of Hispanic families received stimulus payments compared to 96% uh, of white respondents. Um, to a, a survey, and then about 75% of Hispanic families took the credit, uh, the child tax credit in 2019 or 2020, um, compared to 84% of white families. And so one of the questions is sort of why, you know, why are we seeing these disparities and how are we addressing them? Um, uh, I think there's a few explanations about why, you know, why we're seeing these, these uh, barriers. One is public charge rules um, for folks, uh, you know, will remember that the Trump uh, administration tried to change the public charge um, regulation so that uh, a whole number of things would be considered as part of the public charge test and would potentially prevent someone from being able to access a green card. Um, and, you know, that the legacy of public charge continues to this day. And I hear throughout the country that people are saying, oh, I don't want to file taxes or I don't want to get a tax credit because I don't want to be a public charge because of that, you know, the Trump era. Uh, and even though that that regulation has since been rescinded um, and the Biden administration has implemented a new one that makes it very clear that tax credits are not part of public charge, the legacy of that um, of that uh, era uh, continues. We have a huge lack of culturally competent outreach. Um, uh, you know, we uh, definitely need to talk about language access and cultural competence when it comes to uh, providing tax pre preparation, um, you know, and even just thinking about different views of paying taxes and, you know, not just for Latinos, but for all different types of immigrants and that they need to be targeted to different populations because not, there's not going to be one message, one size fits all message that's going to work for all immigrant populations. Um, financial costs, of course, of preparing taxes, and then the higher unbacked rates among immigrants um, is, is also another huge barrier um, to tax credits. So one of the things that in response to the fact that the, the, the EITC and the CTC uh, are not available to people without uh, social security numbers, um, the, there's been an increase in state activity in, in, in creating uh, state earned income tax credits 
and child tax credits that are available to ITIN filers. So as of July, as of this month, um, there are eight states plus the District of Columbia that offer uh, uh, the, their state earned income tax credits to ITIN filers. Um, and uh, as of uh, this, this summer, there are also six states that offer ITIN inclusive state child tax credits. Um, these are these are intended to fill the gap from the fact that 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 ITIN filers are prevented from receiving the federal uh, tax credits. However, there are some problems. Um, first of all, and these are this this will get into the policy solutions um, part of the presentation. So currently, the IRS will only issue ITINs for individuals that need them for a federal per tax purpose, and that's defined as a federal tax liability or eligibility for a federal tax credit. However, many people, because of these new um, inclusive tax credits may be eligible for a state EITC or a state CTC. However, because that's not a federal tax purpose, they're unable to get the ITIN issued to them. So our first recommendation is that the IRS should issue ITINs to taxpayers who may not have a federal tax liability or be eligible for a federal refundable credit, but who require an ITIN to receive a state uh, tax level tax credit. So we think we have we can talk about the statute, but we think that there's ways that they could be done without changing the statute. But um, all of these recommendations, I should mention, are part are going to be part of a new bill that I'm working with uh, Senator Cortez Masto on that we hope will be a package to address sort of system systematically address all the barriers that um, or most of the barriers that uh, ITIN filers are facing. And I'd also would love to hear if people have other recommendations for other things that should be included in this uh, this legislation that I haven't mentioned. Um, the second piece, of course, would be to fix the PATH Act. Um, uh, this this bill would uh, allow retroactive claims, um, and uh, you know, especially during the pandemic. Again, we know that many people missed out on the enhanced child tax credit, um, and there were particular racial disparities. So the easy fix is allow retroactive claims, fix the 2015 PATH Act, and rescind that um, that those provisions of the PATH Act. Uh, third, uh, eliminate the social security number requirement for, for tax credits like the CTC and EITC. Um, Congress should go ahead and remove those, those requirements and, and make those uh, uh, families eligible for that again. And then getting more granular, uh, you know, we, there are some things that are regulatory, um, but that we want to put into this piece of legislation, but we think that the IRS um, could be able to do on its own. Um, is one is the IRS should allow for electronic processing of ITIN applications. Currently, they have to, you have to paper file. Um, and there's no reason in 2023 that we should be paper filing uh, applications. Um, two, the IRS should allow certified acceptance agents uh, to upload uh, documents uh, uh, that they have verified. Um, and, and again, sort of electronic uh, 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 modernization of the process. Um, we also think that the ITIN application should be processed on a rolling basis and be received and should be accepted without a tax return. We should get rid of that tax return requirement. There's no statutory reason why they have to include a tax return as part of their W-7 applications. Um, processing times, as Mandy sort of talked about, should be accurately and publicly reported, and they should be reduced from the current nine to 11 weeks. It's really too long, and it's also longer than it was even prior to the pandemic. It was shorter than nine to 11 weeks. So that, that amount of time has actually increased. Um, we think that the IRS should create an ITIN unit uh, customer service telephone number, and all correspondence from the ITIN, IRS to ITIN filers should include a contact number for an IRS staff person that they can follow up with about their um, issues. Um, and then, you know, outreach, uh, tax prep, and CAAs. So we need to improve outreach to immigrant communities. Um, they should really be emphasizing the statutory confidentiality for protections for IRS data so that immigrant families aren't worried that their data is going to be shared with immigration agents. Although, as as, as has been discussed, sometimes that happens um, in ways that are, are outside of the federal um, confidentiality provisions. Um, we also, you know, the, 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 there should be trainings for VITA sites and other tax preparers that are culturally competent and that have language access to ensure that they're culturally competent and have language access uh, resources. Uh, the IRS should expedite the approval of applications by organizations seeking to become CAAs, which would mean actually getting rid of the moratorium. We should lift that moratorium and we should, we desperately need more CAAs. I can tell you that the, also another issue is that the CAA list, if you go to the IRS website and you want to look up the CAA list, there's two different like pages that you can look up where your local CAA is. One of them, you have to scroll through all the international sites before you get to the US states and territories um, site, and it's very confusing. And a lot of those are actually outdated and incorrect. So they, you know, we really need to fix the CAA list um, 
uh, and, 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 and have more CAAs available because in a lot of rural areas and other places, you know, unless you're in like Los Angeles or New York City or something like that, you're not going to have the same access to CAAs. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a lot of innovative solutions that could, um, that could, you know, for example, the co-location of CAAs and organizations trusted by ITIN filers, like a worker center or something like that. Um, we think that there could be sort of a tax mobile kind of mobile tax services that could go out to immigrant communities, um, lots of different um, uh, uh, innovative things. And then finally, just uh, ITIN data, um, the IRS should make available data on uh, ITIN returns and tax contributions. This is an urgent need that we have. Um, we can't understand the scope of the problem if we don't understand what's going on. So that, with that, I will conclude my presentation and I will pass it over to Pablo. Pablo, you wanna start? Yes, sure, thank you so much. So thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Pablo Blanc. I am the director of Filmir and Integration at CASA. CASA is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1985 in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And 35 years later, we are now in four states, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. We are a membership-based organization, and we have members in 45 states with, with over 120,000 members. And we run four vital sites, free tax preparation, uh, recruiting over 50 volunteers and helping more than 1,600 taxpayers to file federal and state tax in uh, returns. And we uh, have a, a staff member who is a certified acceptance agent, so I can address a little, bit, a little bit more about that. The nature of the challenge is that people migrate. And when people migrate, uh, customs change, laws change, et cetera, right? So most migrants are low-income migrants. And in, in, in the case of, for example, in Latin America, it, most of the people don't pay income tax in, in their home countries. So when they come to the US and find, they find a system that is income tax is almost universal where you have to file uh, taxes uh, all the time, you, you don't know that, you are not prepared for that, you don't understand that. Not to mention that you have you are dealing at the same time that you have to deal with this, you are dealing with cultural issues, with legal issues, with family issues, with uh, with nostalgia issues, and all of that, right? So in the, in that environment, the, the person who comes here, because usually we think about social security person, we uh, number, IT number, but we forget that there is a person and there is a family behind that that number. So that that person is the one that needs to adapt uh, to to the new environment. So um, this is this is the, the 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 nature of the challenge, and uh, we believe that supporting migrants to pay taxes is an inclusion policy, right? So migrants want to pay taxes. Migrants want to uh, be part of the society where they are now, and if we make things uh, things easy for them. If easier or we, we, we help them to comply, they will be happily uh, applying for taxes because uh, they, they, want to, they, they want to belong and paying taxes is, is another inclusion policy. Um, what are the, the, the issues about ITINs and, um, and the impact on people? Um, as as uh, Mandy and, and Jackie mentioned before, uh, you can only apply for uh, an IT during tax season, and that is to begin with. If you are if you are a project manager, regardless of tax uh, outside tax issues, you would never add a, a new task to uh, to to a group to a team when the in in the peak of the season, right? So if you are doing tax season. You will try to do ITs outside tax season, so your your team doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't become over over uh, overwork. So I think that uh, first to, to first that, that there is a mistake in the in the in the reasoning and in the in, in the system how it's created. We should allow migrants to file for ITs outside tax season, so then. During tax season, they can file uh, for the tax, and everyone, everything is more smoothly, right? So, um, the other thing is, how many of you would file, would mail your passport to the IRS and wait for four, five, six months to get your passport back? What happens if you have to travel abroad for work, 
or you have to travel abroad because a family issue during those four or five, six months, you will not be able to do it, right? So that is what the IRS is asking uh, people to file for taxes. They are asking them to mail their, their passport. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the um, attendees today was sharing in the, in the chat that uh, the IRS is, is losing passports. Uh, right now there are people who are losing the, who, are, who no longer have access to the passport and the, uh, and the IRS says, no, we never received the passport. So you, you send your, your passport inside an envelope and without any without any warranty, without any acknowledgement that at least the passport is there, so is the burden of the taxpayer to is uh, to to show that the passport is there. So there is an there is an a, a, another a way to file, so you don't have to send your passport. That is the certified accept an agent system, but it was so broken that the IRS froze the system one year ago and is working on modern, modernizing the, the process. The IRS says that they will have the new process up and running in the summer. So we are in the summer. We are waiting to see what, what they come up. Um, we are curious because we didn't have options to, uh, we were not called by the IRS to participate in the, in the, the development of the new system. So we are very curious what they have uh, found as a modern system to process CAAs, right? So CAAs is basically a, a person who takes a training to certify a photocopy of the passport. So the person needs to understand that the original uh, passport is, is, is not fake, is, is actual, and then make a copy, sign the, sign the copy, and the person, the taxpayer can send the photocopy instead of the original passport. That should be very, very easy to do, but unfortunately the system is broken and is not easy to do. And then as Jackie was mentioning, if you see the list of a CAA, a, the Certified Acceptance Agency in Maryland, for example, you will see that probably 95% of them are for-profit uh, companies, are people who working in for-profit tax, prepar uh, tax preparers. Non-profit organizations don't have the chance to uh, easily apply to CAAs. Even if you see the list of Vita sites, free tax preparation services, who holds a CAA inside the site, there are no more than 10 in the whole country. CASA is one of them, but there is no more than 10. So, so you can see that the CAA, the Certified Acceptance Agent uh, system is broken and hopefully they will repair it in the, in the right way. We, we want to see that. Um, and it's, it's a real problem because it's also dignity, right? So sending, sending your, your main picture ID, uh, probably the only picture ID document that you have in the country, mailing that is, and, we, and, and staying without that picture ID is, is a dignity issue also, right? It's not, it's a, almost a human right. You, you, are, you are leaving, you are sending your only passport who can prove that the who you are, and, uh, and hoping that the IRS, the IRS will send you the, that uh, back. And the other issue when, when you are trying to apply for an IT is a big issue, what happened with dependents? Because, uh, because we, we have serious, uh, serious issues. For example, um, the IRS requires that uh, if, if a kid is in, in, the, in the school, you need to send, you need to mail to the IRS the, uh, the original uh, report card of the school signed uh, with a signature by, by a school, uh, by a school uh, agent. The issue is that many school systems don't sign the report cards. And when the families go to the school to ask for the signature, the school says, oh no, this was issued by the superintendent, so the principal cannot sign this report card. And then we have, for example, uh, two weeks ago, we have a family a single mother with three kids uh, who filed for uh, for ITIN and an ITIN for the three dependents. The two older dependents were in a school, so they they were accepted. But the younger dependent is not yet in a school because she's three years old. So we attach um, a, cert a, a hospital certification of the of the um, vaccination, the vaccination card for the kid. Unfortunately, the hospital who knows why, forgot to include the, the phone number of the hospital in that vaccination card. 
So the IRS reject the full the, the full package because uh, the full number of the of the hospital was not included there. So yes, there is a hostile a, a hostile environment, right? As Mandy mentioned, there is a hostile environment in the IRS against uh, ITINs, and and they are very very picky on on many issues and and details. So uh, talking about uh, solutions, we are advocating for the IRS to create a particular form that families can take to the school or can take to the uh, to the doctor, including all the information that they the IRS requires. So once the school issue the document, once the doctor issue the document, is uh, sufficient to to prove uh, to prove what what the IRS needs. And the background, the, the backlogs that in in, uh, in IT issuance that uh, Jackie was mentioning um, is also a big impact. Provides a, also a big impact in in the people because, for example, in Maryland there are very generous state uh, tax benefits for IT holders, and they cannot uh, they cannot receive the the money uh, because uh, the IRS doesn't issue the uh, the IT for them. And they have been waiting probably six months, eight months, and they need the money, that money that the state of Maryland is giving them to pay the rent, to buy food for the kids, because it's, now it's winter and they need to, uh, to buy a jacket for the kids. So there are very basic needs that they can, the families can use the money for, uh, that legislators in Maryland give the money for uh, these people but the IRS not issuing the, the IT on time creates a big, a big barrier for them. And why if I, if a social security, if I, if I have a social security number, uh, I can use my social security number to get my, my, uh, my state uh, tax benefits. Why if I have an IT, I should not use my IT to get the state, the, the state benefits, right? So, so uh, is 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 not thinkable that asking a state to create a, an state tax uh, ID because that would create a lot of confusion in the people, a lot of confusion in the system. So the IT, the federal IT, should be uh, sufficient and should be uh, accepted for all the for all the states. Also, people uh, there are. 10 states that issue driver license for undocumented immigrants. Some of those states or most of those states require for a one or two years of tax, uh, of tax payment in, in those states as proof of uh, residency. And if you don't have the IT, you cannot have access to those driver licenses. And finally, I would like to uh, briefly talk about the VITA sites. Uh, Vita sites are free tax preparation services for families who make less than sixty thousand um, dollars. And uh, it's incredible to know to think that over fifty percent of taxpayers in the U.S. should be are eligible to receive free tax preparation services. More than fifty percent of the taxpayers, more ninety million uh, tax returns. But the problem is that the, the Congress only allocates for Vita sites forty forty seven million dollars a year. So it's like uh, is allocating like 50 cents per tax return who, who is eligible to receive the, the service. So we really think that uh, Congress should uh, increase notable, probably four times, five times the, 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 the budget that is allocating for VITA sites. So people can uh, receive free tax preparation and, and comply with the with the requirements because vita sites not only not only are free not only are located around the around uh, where, where the people where taxpayers are but also are high quality because are certified because they use certified uh, tax preparers and most importantly many times are cultural culturally and linguistically appropriate so vita sites are a great solution that needs more funding uh, for for to support um, uh, taxpayers. So thank you so much, and I will be open to answer any questions. Go back to you, Nina. Well, this is terrific, and we've had a really active chat, and I think folks are really trying to respond to some of the comments and issues that are raised. 
I wanted to just follow back up, you know, one of the, as we think about solutions, one of the solutions that we've really been, what we focused on in the 2008 annual report to Congress when we discussed ITINs, and then was the subject of my taxpayer advocate directive to the wage and investment commissioner that got elevated to the deputy commissioner, was precisely what Jackie and you all have said, is process ITINs on a rolling basis. Now, again, to go back to the original concern about ITINs that serve surfaced after September 11th was the idea that this could be used as some kind of identity documentation and would allow people to, to use it to establish identities in the country and then do terrorist acts, whatever, or lead to terrorist financing. Um, and so the IRS put in rules to require that there be a tax-related purpose for getting an ITIN. And our recommendation in 2008 until 2009 was, first of all, why do you want these returns during the filing season, which is the busiest time of year and you're all swamped, you're just, and you're creating harm to the taxpayers who are legitimately able to process a return. You're delaying whatever refund they may have coming to them. So allow, you know, a, you know maybe starting after the filing season, starting June 1st of every single year, or even July 1st, allow taxpayer people to come in with proof that they, you know, file a W-7 and proof that they had, they had some thing, reason to file. Now, that might be that you submit a copy of a birth certificate. So your child, now many countries don't have birth certificates, but you're showing some evidence that you have a child that you will ultimately claim on a return. Other evidence that you have some kind of earnings whether it's a pay stub, whether it's, you know, some information for, that you've gotten some kind of work chit or something like that. Now, I realize that that's not a perfect solution, but that tried to address the IRS's concern, which I don't think they're going to move on, which is that there has to be a tax-related reason for the ITIN. It's not an identity number. Um, but on the other hand, you know, get it out of the filing season, get people to be able to prove, and also, Pablo, to your recommendation about the child doc, you know, just design a form that gets you the information you want, you know, that you could really file it between July and December 31st of the year. And so that way, these taxpayers could file electronically because they had their ITIN number. And the IRS sound roundly rejected that and said they couldn't do it. They never gave any excuse other than, you know, we're protecting the populace. Um, so, you know, we, we've all tried to do these things, but I think these are the kinds of recommendations, the concrete recommendations that we all really want to see. So what I'd like to ask each of you in the last five minutes quickly, one minute each is a lightning round. What thing of all we've talked about would you want to be fixed to solve the problems that your taxpayers are facing? And I'll start with Mary Louise and we'll just go in order. Mary Louise, Mandy, Jackie, and Pablo, you get the last word. So obviously what we would like to be, <laughs> like to have fixed is the actual tax code um, moving over to a residence-based taxation. Um, we'd like to see uh, Treasury uh, implement some regulatory solutions to some of these problems, in particular on the FACA issues, the same country exemption. So I guess that's two things we'd like to see out of, out of what we've talked, but I'll just throw in the, a third thing. Um, and that would be obviously better customer servicing. So uh, until such time that we can really move to uh, a, a residence base um, style, let's say, of taxation, we would really like to see better outreach, better tools for um, the community of Americans overseas to be able to manage their, their, you know, their, their filing. Because like all these communities um, that we've talked about, these are people who want to file. They're not hiding overseas. They're not hiding money overseas. Uh, they may not like the current system of taxation, but by and large, they want to be able to file, but they want to be able to do it simply, easily, and get some answers and servicing from the IRS and have online ability to, to, mm -hmm. to file and to, and, and to get information. Great. Mandy? 
I mean, there are so many problems <laughs> with the process. And I guess two things that I that occur to me are decoupling the tax return from the application process and an appeals process so that someone has an independent reviewer who looks and sees whether the denial is in compliance with the law. And um, and and the person who's uh, participating in the appeals process actually gets to speak with that person, <laughs> whereas um, up until that point, they'll not have spoken with anyone in the I-10 unit. Right. Great. That's really good. Uh, Jackie? I guess for me, there's, I'll just do the easy statutory stuff and say, you know, that they should allow for the retroactive um, receipt of tax credits. They should undo the PATH Act and they should undo the social security number requirement for the EITC and the CTC. Yeah. The, the big, I'll ask for the big stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Pablo, last, last word. Well, my, my, my dream is to have immigration reform so everybody has a social security number and we don't need uh, to discuss any more items. But while we fight for that, the, the ITIN application should be online, should be friendly to the to dependents, and should be uh, earlier than tax season. Great. Thank you all. You've been incredible. I'm this is such a difficult issue and I'm so, I'm I just think the work that you're doing on all fronts and this also goes to the folks on the on the on the chat watching I just really am grateful to the work that you're doing in this area and um I know we've learned a lot we will be posting this video we will be posting the slides we will also be including links um, all, you know, to the materials. We're also welcome. You have info at taxpayerrights-.org, taxpayer-rights.org. If there are any comments or suggestions about, about information that you think would be helpful to the folks that you are serving, just let us know. And I will see you, um, we will see you next week. We're going to have a tax chat on the 25th about VITAs and LITCs and the path to the future, what some of the challenges are, but also how to improve the work that the VITAs and, and LITCs are doing. So we'll see you then. Thanks so much. And thank you again to everyone. Bye. Thanks, Nina. Bye-bye.